Well, appreciate uh, the chance to uh, to get to be here today. And um, Lori had, had contacted me quite a while. You know, it's like April, I think, is when you contacted me. So I'll give her props uh, relative to planning on, on getting that accomplished. Um, and uh, uh, appreciate the chance again to to be here. I'm going to touch on actually quite a few different things. And again, uh, utilizing my, my, the time and resources uh, for, for getting me here, I, I get... I had a goat talk yesterday, all right, and so if you don't like this talk that I'm giving right now at, at 10, come back at 11, we'll do a different one, <laughs> kind of, but I think that they'll mesh well, uh, and I'm excited about that, and I, I like how uh, this has been designed. Uh, a little bit relative to, uh, to introduction and, and just kind of being here, all right, in uh, Elmwood, Ontario, on my destination vacation, all right, um, and so which is great. Uh, I grew up, uh, home for me is South Dakota, was uh, where I grew up. And again, uh, we had Cordell sheep. That's a, a picture of one uh, right there. I'll show one uh, maybe a little bit later um, as well. But now I'm at North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota uh, as the extension sheep specialist. But knowing that, uh, you know, that I'm hanging out, you know, here in Ontario, right? I did my part, all right? I watched Canada win a World Junior Nationals last night. Okay, see? And so I, I felt like I was, you know, a domestic native, uh, kind of, uh, but so that did happen. See, everybody else did too. They watched that. And uh, the other thing is, is that uh, as I traveled uh, from uh, Fargo, North Dakota, and everybody's like, oh, it's going to be cold there. And I get it. Okay. It's brisk. Just a little bit brisk out. But it's brisk everywhere. Okay. And all right. What people don't realize is that I did fly south uh, to get here. Okay. And so uh, even though it's a... <laughs> Across the border, I moved latitudinally south. But um, of what I'm going to primarily talk about uh, today, uh, at least in this initial one, is, is, is a focus on a, a, a PhD project that I worked on. And uh, lucky, sometimes you get put in the right place at the right time, and, and everything works out nicely. And uh, I, I've had some great opportunities. When I was a youngster, again, uh, in, in junior high or high school, I wanted to know why this lamb was better than that lamb, okay? And I'd get to judge some shows, and then you make stuff up on a microphone and talk, call it good, okay? Um, or is there differences in value? And so between the two talks that I'll do today, it's kind of a little bit of a fruition of, of pulling all of that together on quality, okay? And I think quality is an exciting word, and uh, I commend Jennifer on, on the tremendous amount of, of good research that they're accomplishing within their group. Um, but I'm going to look at it a little bit differently. And, and in fact, uh, I apologize just a little bit on this first one that most of this, again, uh, is looking at American lamb, all right? But that's, that's why Lori uh, invited me up here, all right? And so we'll mo do more of the application to it to your operation in the second one. But what we describe lamb relative to uh, a consumer, and again, this is information that comes from the American Lamb Board, is that 40% of consumers have never eaten lamb. All right, and I would recommend, I would presume that to be relatively similar or or not very different uh, here in Canada. Okay, and in fact, um, uh, that's probably pretty true. Males uh, are more likely to be lamb eaters uh, than females, and in fact, uh, you have an increase in individuals on income uh, that plays a role in lamb consumption. All right, part of that is because lamb's expensive. All right. And so, in fact, when I was in uh, Seattle, Washington, I, I have a great picture that has the, the lobster, cheaper than the rack of lamb. Okay, it's pretty tough to compete then, all right? Um, but, and, and we have lamb consumption is linked to special occasions. Uh, lamb consumers prefer buying American lamb of 75% of it, and half of those were willing to pay for it, but I'll show you a little bit more. And I think as we discuss it in our second talk, uh, the allegiances to the domestic product that we talk about here uh, that's raised in Canada. So total U.S. lamb sales, I throw this up uh, just because it follows this every year for us uh, in the U.S. And, and you can see relative to the amount of total lamb dollars, okay, of, of what happens. And you guys know what that is. What's that spike? Easter, absolutely. Boom. All right. Everybody nailed that. So 38% of the households that buy lamb uh, for home preparation, and millennials are pushing that growth, all right? And as I get to uh, be at a university setting, and uh, I tell all the, uh, the individuals that we have there is that, that's right, I snuck in. I'm still a millennial, all right? I have a more aerodynamic haircut than most, 
but I'm still a millennial and I, I snuck in. Um, but those millennials are really important. And I think that that's, uh, again, something that we can and need to focus on as we look at it of, of providing an adventurous product. American, or not just American, but lamb that was in retail stores in the U.S. averaged approximately $7 a pound. And that's all cuts, okay? And so some of those are more, some of them are less that we'll talk about here. 2016, in the U.S., lamb increased at retail, increased in terms of pounds. Those are the prices that were last Easter, just so that you know. And again, that's U.S., that's some, uh, New Zealand and American. And in fact, we could have done this whole thing on imports and, and how there's a competition along that. But bone-in legs were at 570, racks at 1085, loin chops at 782, and shoulder chops at 498. Now, in fact, that is a little bit more depressed prices as you average in those imported products uh, in comparison as well. I like to throw this in as well as looking at lamb as the retail uh, or percent of the dollar per animal. Okay, and so we have the big four primal cuts of, of shoulder, rib, okay, loin, and leg. Uh, and again, those are going to uh, uh, be relatively similar uh, depending on that, but obviously from a pricing standpoint, um, those are things that we want to make sure that we can sell all of those at a logical price and, and try to make uh, some money because we can't just make money on the racks uh, or just make money on the loins, okay? Uh, I put this in here as well in terms of just uh, percent of, of the lamb product that's sold. And so the different regions in the United States have different preferences on what cuts and what uh, products are being able to be merchandised at the highest level. I put next to each location or region, the cut uh, that is the most prominent uh, within that merchandising area. And I put them in the order of the region in terms of consumption. And so in America, the northeast portion is the largest consumer per capita consumer. And in the United States, all right, we are rocking it at per capita consumption at 0 0.88 pounds per person per year. Okay. So whenever I think that I'm doing a good job, I can look this up, all right, and realize that as Americans, we consume more garlic than we do lamb, okay? So I got room to move forward. Top 10 restaurant trends uh, of 2017, and I, I highlight a couple just because I think that they're important, and I think that they fit uh, for lamb consumption, okay? And so the number three one natural ingredients and clean menus. And I'll talk about that in a little bit later, but I believe that the image of lamb is very holistic, okay? And I think we have a tremendous advantage uh, from that standpoint. Environmental sustainability, all right? Is sheep an environmental sustainable product? Well, I like to think so, or at least in terms of the vision, uh, we have kind of that extensive type of approach or, or thought process with people. Locally sourced meat and seafood, and again, I'll talk about the advantages of local, and then uh, this one, I apologize, this is too small to read from afar, but this were the cuts at restaurants with rack of lamb at 31%, loin chop at 28.7%, uh, sausage and shank, and then loin were the next uh, that rounded out the five of what was in uh, restaurant tours and, and in their menus. So a big part of the research, again, that we accomplished on a, a national lamb quality audit uh, was to identify what is quality, okay, and, and how can we define um, a quality, identify the strategies, implement an action plan, and, and try to see what we can do. I put those next kind of bullets because those are kind of some summary things that I'll expound on here in just a second. But a bold flavor, a trendy protein, lamb, uh, the next kale, I, that was all me, okay, that didn't come from the research. I was just hoping, it seems cool. kale's pretty trendy, lamb could follow pretty quickly. Um, husbandry and stewardship, uh, and the local and grass-fed movement, at least in some places, is real, and uh, lamb is the protein that's, in generality, is the closest to the earth in terms of, of how people define it. Now, back to not made up stuff from Travis, but actually the research, okay, is that we asked people, and we asked an open-ended question of what is lamb? And the question of what is lamb, uh, uh, the first thing that came up was young sheep. And in fact, people with the word L-A-M-B more so thought of the animal than the protein, and which is very different because cattle produce beef, and pigs or swine 
produce pork, okay? And maybe you could say it's sheep that produce lamb, but the, the connotation between the animal and the protein to some is a negative uh, challenge because they think of that more so as, as the animal and even um, of providing it um, a little bit more challenging. Red meat alternative, delicious and flavorful, uh, delicacy and high end, and healthy, okay? And so one of the things that we realized from this is that if we describe healthy as the reason that we want to merchandise lamb, that's probably not the best reason. And we'll, I'll touch on that uh, because we had the information from our retailers, okay? And so I had 31 supermarkets, 11 butchers, 18 farmers markets, uh, food service of fine dining of 23, casual dining 22, and purveyors or, or groups that help to uh, provide that product at 15. And so we did that research, and again, uh, from a retail uh, standpoint, okay, uh, retail cases are very different. Um, I got the opportunity to travel uh, to lots of different areas, and in fact, uh, we worked with uh, Ohio State University, and this was uh, while I was at Colorado State University. Uh, but here in, in San Antonio, okay, they had a, a big screen and, and playing a video relative to merchandising it. It can be that elaborate in comparison to, all right, whole lamb carcasses hanging out at 315 a pound, okay? So a little bit different, a little bit more wholesale at, at that standpoint. But certainly some nice opportunities. And in fact, from a restaurant standpoint, again, it's good to have lamb featured in those whether it's a grocery store that has lamb or more specifically domestic lamb, whether that's American or here uh, Canadian, uh, those people that come in those grocery stores more commonly will purchase uh, with a higher bill at the end, not just because of the lamb, but because those people that purchase lamb are also purchasing the higher end goat cheese and the higher end maybe red wine in the corner. Um, uh, but from a restaurant standpoint, uh, I believe, and again, I'll talk about this here a little bit later, but, you know, those food channels and those restaurant tours, this is real. We are now at a point, I think, uh, personally, that, that food is a large part of our culture, okay? And it's a celebration. I believe that, uh, that eating is a, a celebration, and luckily for you guys, you'll get to have some lamb here at lunch, okay? And so uh, there's certainly some good opportunities uh, from that standpoint, but Nobody ever particularly wants to say, okay, you know, hey, maybe I want to go have a burger in the corner. Or, you know, no one ever goes out for their 20-year uh, wedding anniversary and says, I'll have a chicken salad sandwich, all right? So we can nail that. The steaks and the proteins in general uh, have a little bit of an advantage. This is a quick story here. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Mike Harper. Mike Harper feeds more lambs in America than anybody else uh, that there is. has about an 80,000 head uh, lamb feedlot. We went to... Uh, uh, a restaurant in Reno, Nevada, uh, where the uh, convention was, and he had this lamb that's on the right. He said, man, that was amazing. That was awesome. It was cooked correctly. It was fun. It was, had great flavor, and look how big the chops are. That was awesome. It's just really good to see American lamb um, do that well, and so then we got to meet this chef, okay, and, and Mike Towers at like five foot six, so you can imagine how tall that guy is, um, but um, the chef came out and boom, dropped the lamb um, rack onto the table and it was uh, Costco lamb from Australia. And a little bit of Mike Harper died that day. Okay? And so as much as we think that we're winning relative to quality is, is, is are we? All right? And I think you have to ask yourself the same questions uh, with that. Now, if we were to define lamb quality and the way we set up this uh, research project was to leave it extremely open-ended. Because you have to be careful, because if we're going to ask what quality traits are important, you don't want to lead them to, well, do you think grass-fed's important? Or what about local or antibiotic-free? And so we left it very, very open. And in fact, we allowed those individuals to define what these seven terms were, and then we put them in order. Okay? So, um, I, again, uh, I'm, I'm not a very good presenter. I try to be a facilitator or something like that, all right? And so, origin, what's the first thing that comes to mind? We're going to do one for each of these. What do you got? What's that? What are restaurateurs and uh, grocers going to say origin is? Even for your guys'. Local, okay, good. Local is a good one. All right, sheep raising practices, what does that mean? One thing, who wants it? Grass-fed, Grass -fed. okay. 
All right, eating satisfaction, what does that mean? Taste, Taste. okay. Weight and size, what does that mean? Muscle. Portion, what's that? Muscle line. If, Mu it's, if it's small, you're not going to get much for chocolate. That's okay, yep, muscularity in general. Product appearance and composition, what does that mean? What's that? Fat, Fat. all right, good. All right, outstanding product convenience and form. Cost and ready to eat. Ready to eat? Yeah. Okay, sir. And nutrition and wholesomeness, what does that mean? Oh. Healthy, okay. Uh, Lori, we'll see how they did, but they whipped butt, okay. They did pretty darn good. So, eating satisfaction. You said taste. Boom, lamb flavor and taste is number one followed by tenderness. Origin, boom, we nailed that. Locally raised uh, was actually more important than American. Sheep raising practices, you guys na nailed that. Grass fed was first, okay? Two is humanely raised. Uh, product appearance and composition, you got that one right. It leaned to fat ratio. Second was color, okay? Weight and size was actually consistent, was more important than just size because there is so much difference in terms of variability. Healthy, all right, we nailed that one. And product convenience and form, it wasn't that it was ready to cook. It was, uh, where can I get it? Okay. So uh, you guys did really, really good. I think you nailed five out of seven, which is awesome. Either you read it somewhere, just that darn good, and we spent too much money on a project that you already knew about. Um, but the, the second thing is, is to rank those, okay? And uh, to put those in an order, and now, again, I don't like to throw too much uh, scientific uh, portions at it. But if we rank those, and these are the quick abbreviations on the bottom side on the x-axis of the first one being eating satisfaction. So eating satisfaction was more than double any of the other six traits. So the reason that we consume lamb is because of eating satisfaction. Origin next in line. Sheep raising practices. Uh, product appearance and composition. Weight and size nutrition and wholesomeness, and product convenience and form. In fact, if we were to say, if it was a requirement, if it was something that they had to have in order to purchase it, there was two things that they would do, origin or sheep raising practices. And so they might say, oh, it has to be local, or it has to be American. Or on the sheep raising practices, they would say, it has to be grass fed, it has to be antibiotic free. So those different things said that they would potentially have to be part of it, but people that were willing to pay for it, the highest was for eating satisfaction and the largest percentile at 18%. If you could guarantee eating satisfaction, people would potentially pay up to 18%. And we kind of get that with different branded programs, okay? And different brand guarantees of what they could do. So the reason that people purchase lamb is because of flavor. And the reason that people don't purchase lamb is because of flavor, okay? And so um, a big picture, that was uh, as good of a, a portion that we could identify uh, of saying this is where we need to put our research, uh, at least in the U.S. industry, uh, as we move forward. Because that lamb flavor is that quality eating experience that hopefully we could command and win, uh, particularly at restaurants, uh, and at, at least in grocery stores if we so get the chance. The next thing is, as we describe this, is that, okay, we dug a little deeper and share a little bit more on it uh, since this was our key finding is that eating satisfaction is important. Flavor is the definition of eating satisfaction. Well, what's good, okay? Uh, palatability descriptions. They said flavor and taste, good flavor, flavorful, all right? And this is interesting. And again, I told you that we were going to be looking at American lamb on this. But 34 of them said that it was a strength, 14 said it was a weakness, 21 an opportunity, and 11 a threat. Okay, and you're like, okay, maybe that's good. But if you keep, if you put strength and opportunity together in comparison to weakness and threat, it's like two to one. But why should we have a third of our people saying that, that uh, flavor is our biggest challenge? Okay? And so maybe we can describe this just a little bit more. An American lamb flavor is good. What does good mean? I don't know. That's what they said. Milder, 
flavorful and different than grass flavor were the most common images of American lamb. Now, if you want to get just a tick more confused, let's look at it from an imported standpoint. It's less flavorful, gamey, different, stronger, and consistent. And I don't think any of these five say the same thing. All right? So now I'm really confused. Our target is flavor. We have no idea what direction we're going relative to defining it. And so I'll show you some research more so in the, the second presentation to say that we can be able to uh, get a little bit closer. But at least there's a, a pretty vague discrepancy uh, now as we define that. So flavor is number one. That's the most important. The second thing that came up as our powerful trend is that local is real. The local movement absolutely and totally is no longer a niche type function in the corner. Okay? Farmers markets are real. People want to know that connection because people uh, are disconnected now more than ever, right? And this isn't uh, different from agriculture. Okay? There was a time when most people were in agriculture, and then there was a time when some people, and then a few, and now Jillian, very few. Okay? And so, in fact, they don't know nearly as much, and that's why. Here's the fun part about local, all right? And there's some other research that says this, is that if you find somebody of, of the local person, thanks for being my local person, all right? And so if we go to your place and we purchase some lamb from you, well, is it organic? And you say, no. Well, it, it is to me, thanks. At least I know you, and they think it's organic, all right? All right, is your meat antibiotic-free? And you're like, well, no, okay. Is it grass-fed? Well, no. But it's local, so it's okay. It's that stuff to me, <laughs> all right? It's really weird. Like, local trumps everything. If they know who you are, if they know where they get it from, you, and they provide that assurances, okay, it's that belief in what you uh, do and what you produce. Okay, this is a, a project on the, on the plains of, uh, of North Dakota. Just kidding, all right? Again, I spent 12 years at Colorado, okay? And so this was uh, research on my master's degree. And we followed these lambs. Uh, Jennifer, in terms of traceability, traceability is a great thing, and in fact, it followed it from kind of the, your code of practices or quality assurance, and uh, so that's what my master's project was, and uh, that's awesome, but it also had some portion of predation because we lost over 20% to bears, and so it doesn't really matter how good they were traceable because we didn't find the tags, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, but those that we loaded into the truck, we knew which ones were there. Um, but anyway, so, um, but big picture, uh, I, I believe that, uh, and I touched on this just initially there, is that we have uh, that environmental stewardship uh, of lamb, okay? And so I truthfully believe that if you think of pork or pigs, all right, and again, we're here on sheep day, some people think of confinement barns. If you think of chickens or even layers, some people think of them being in small cages in barns. If you think of beef cattle, sometimes it's potentially on feedlots as well. Now, do we feed some lambs in commercial feedlot industry? Absolutely, at least in the United States we do. And I know that particularly in some, more so probably in, in western part of Canada, they certainly do that as well, all right? But our consumer doesn't think that, okay? And so, at least in America, they're convinced that all sheep are born on the luscious grass pastures of Montana and Utah. Okay? And nobody's told them differently, which is okay. All right? But, I mean, certainly we need to embrace that we're still providing a grain-finished um, product because I think we have advantages from that standpoint in terms of flavor, but we have that holistic uh, approach and thought. Here's a, a slide with, uh, with too many words on it. I'll let you touch on that, but big picture, lamb is safe. Okay? And I put that exclamation point on there, and, and I looked at all of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention information from 1998 to 2014 to see if and how many there were for foodborne illnesses attributed to lamb. Okay? One on e, or on e. coli, Washington and Ohio, and three cases of salmonella, salmonella enterica in New York, Massachusetts, and New York, or, and then in New York again. Okay, five cases in 16, 17 years—that's unreal. Okay, we have a tremendous advantage in terms of safety and pathogen-free products in lamb consumption. All right. One of the other focuses was ethnic marketing, and again, I'll, I'll try, try to touch on that 
a little bit uh, this afternoon, and in fact, we talked about it some uh, in our, our goat day yesterday, because if you were producing particularly meat goats and you're not at least driving some of your plans and your marketing towards ethnic marketing, you're absolutely and totally missing out, all right? So we have a commercial industry, and again, of course, uh, having Jennifer and having other individuals that know more about uh, where your harvest facilities are, and as I understand it, at least there's two, uh, particularly here in Ontario, uh, that work, but there's also opportunities, and in fact, uh, okay, uh, this is interesting of whether it's halal and an Indian focus, okay, uh, a more Mediterranean or even African uh, uh, focus, okay, this guy uh, had a, a Greek restaurant, lots of differences, but what I've understood and learned just a little bit here is that, uh, and, and these, these are just cut up. The shoulders were the same amount as the rack, is worth the same amount as the loin, worth the same amount as the leg, and in fact, some of the times, whether it's goat or lamb, they'll just cube it, okay? Let's cube it and call it good, all right? And so uh, we do have that uh, option uh, for us uh, to, to be able to have uh, different ethnic markets and be able to, to work with that. We also found some, some lamb heads, okay? I only found lamb heads one time, all right, in a, in a Mexican uh, restaurant, uh, different shanks, okay? An Asian food uh, location, here's that Mexican restaurant on different ethnic marketing of lamb. Um, and in fact, okay, identifying different cultures or origins or ethnicities of people, all right, that look at being able to merchandise those lambs, okay? And since I'm a local now, because I'm on day three, all right, I also realized that a tremendous amount of our potential audience and consumers is in GTA, okay, or greater Toronto area, as I'm told, all right, so I feel like a local. Um, but uh, obviously, and, and there's, if there's 7 million people there and only 1% of them uh, consume lamb, then we have to get lamb to 70,000 people, all right, which is more sheep than some of us have here in this room, Okay. So we've got some opportunity, and, and I think that, you know, uh, you have to evaluate where you want, and we can talk about that at a later time. That's not where we're particularly going to look at, but we have some opportunity um, to, to work on a, a direct marketing if you so choose, okay? The difference is, is that there's some potential legislations and legal ramifications because if you are um, selling lamb or the meat, all right, it needs to be harvested at the very least in a provincial or um, inspected uh, plants, okay, or it can be a, a national federal inspected plant so you can cross state lines, all right, and in fact, uh, uh, I didn't put my exciting um, uh, sh sheep uh, slaughter one in this presentation, I did in the goat one, but there was in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, okay, individuals, uh, police came because uh, some individuals that were new Americans uh, decided to uh, to whack a sheep in a parking lot of an apartment complex. Okay, so there was no law against it. <laughs> so uh, they made it out without criminal charges, but it's not recommended. Okay, and in fact, uh, as we as you think about it, if you're interested relative to the liability, you're much more better off of selling a live animal to somebody and letting them take that off your premises. Okay, I'm not going to tell you how to do this, um, but you do have the potential to uh, at least decrease liabilities within your uh, operations from that standpoint because we do have a tremendous amount of focus on that non-traditional market. And more so in America as well is that we are now, uh, to the best of our numbers can define, over 50% of the lambs that are born in the United States aren't harvested at 140 pounds at commercial slaughter. They're harvested at 60 or 80 or somewhere in between and go to our non-traditional market or our ethnic-focused um, market, okay? And so if on a sheep day at um, Gray Bruce Farmers Week that we don't understand that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in terms of our market uh, to talk to uh, lots of different people, uh, we'd be missing out. And so we do have some options for us uh, from that standpoint. Country of origin, and again, apologize, we uh, primarily looked at, uh, again, the United States of America, Lamp sorry, Jennifer, all right? But then we also looked at, at our competitors as well. And our competitors are the same competitors as you. Not too much lamb is, of course, uh, 
or even sheep is exported to, uh, from Canada to the United States. But we have New Zealand rack, okay, Australian rack, and U.S. Uh, rack. But in the retail case, and in fact, this was Australia, New Zealand, and then American on the ones that we went to. But big picture, though, those are in per store. Now, we talked to uh, a company called Costco. Okay, Costco is uh, based out of Seattle, and in fact, uh, there's some other examples here uh, in Canada that we could use as well. And so when I talked to them, like, well, why don't you sell American lamb? And they're like, hoo ha 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 ha, Travis, you don't get it. You can't provide enough lamb if every lamb harvested in America comes through our store, because Costco's number one, two, and three, pretty much, okay, in America, in selling proteins. It's only really number one, but I just had to accentuate it a little bit. Um, but um, again, so, so there is a tremendous amount, and in fact, uh, in country of origin labeling, there is more Australian and New Zealand product sold in, uh, in America than American lamb, okay? And so, and I know that that's probably the case here in, in Canada as well. And so you could say, well, is there, is there room, you know? Well, you know, is there room for improvement or is there room to grab our market share? Heck, if we're at 45% of the own lamb that's consumed, pretty convinced we could be a little bit better. I'm pretty convinced that we could try to get uh, uh, some of that back. But um, hopefully, again, uh, that's price point, all right? That's dollar exchange. There's many reasons that would take plenty of uh, the day. I can't put together a, a lamb uh, quality slide without putting this awesome uh, marketing picture in, okay? And so this is us uh, to purchase some shoulder chops. You see any uh, challenge with this? Nice work, nice. Three extra fake bonus points to you, all right. Good, and so this one, straight up, born, hatched, and harvested in the U.S., all right? So, uh, sorry. And this one was, and I, I traveled the country, and this one was actually in the Albertsons in Fort Collins, Colorado, so I didn't have to go very far to find that one. USDA yield grade and quality grade, we'll talk about a little bit about grading in our, our next session, uh, as well, but we are able to use um, yield grade as an indication of cutability and quality grade as a potential indication of palatability or how that uh, is consumed to taste. Here's one that's plenty trim, okay, which we like, and here's one that's a little on the chubby side. Okay, it's farther than a little bit on the chubby side, all right? And in fact, we could talk about that because product appearance and composition, and we'll talk about that uh, in our next talk of, of the detriment of lamb fat, okay? And I'll give you a little lead in, okay, because what tastes worse than lamb fat? That's right, nothing, okay? Because <laughs> if you get too much lamb fat, it comes a little bit more challenging and we lose. But are people using it? Or are they looking at it? Awesome, only 8.3% of the retailers are looking at yield grade, only 33% of the retailers were looking at quality grade. If I'm correct, there's probably not a lot of grading because it's voluntary that's accomplished in our Canadian industry as well, okay? And so it doesn't have to be. Those plants have to pay for it, and if those plants aren't rewarded, at least some from a branding portion of their program, then it's not worth it to them either, okay? Grocers in the grading. So what did they identify? If the grocers were really worried about the animal age and the size, they just purchase smaller carcasses, all right? And I know that um, obviously Canada has some smaller carcasses, and in fact, relative to the supply chain and trying to uh, get rid of seasonality uh, of our U.S. industry, sometimes our lambs get too big, and sometimes they get a little too chubby. And so they'll try to just pick some of the smaller ones, because when those big lambs come through, they have too much fat, uh, the meat cutter is not happy in the product, and they tend not to sell it. This one's uh, fun and entertaining because we talked about product convenience and form. And so on product convenience and form, demand, uh, we had um, on this side, okay, and I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is March 16th, 2015, all right? You could purchase the lamb at 1449. Now you could have got it a year earlier at 1349. But the reason that I know that is because that second one, this was in uh, in... 
North Platte, Nebraska, okay, so Central America, all right, or Central part of America. Um, but the reason that I know that one was because they're like, hey, we got some more in the back. Let me go get you that one. All right, and it was frozen. And uh, that one had an expiration date of May 1, 2014. So only like 11 months earlier. <laughs> all right, and the bag was broken. It was oxidized. It wasn't worth anything, all right? And so nobody had came in for a year and asked for lamb. Okay, they didn't even know what was back there. So availability is certainly part of it uh, for our industry. And here, here's our lobster at $15.99 a pound in Seattle and our sirloin chops at $16.99 a pound in Seattle. Okay, not going to win that one either probably. Okay, lamb marketing. This is my most, uh, you know, food forward or um, lady or maybe this is, you know, she's the one maybe we need to target to, to wool to fashion. All right, um, but maybe she was there at the uh, retail protein case. Uh, we have Lava Lake lamb on different marketings, local I talked about, and identifying those as branding uh, for what works for you. I told you that my emphasis on local and, uh, and understanding that, but I think we also have to have that connection with just the farmer and the rancher in generalities. So in the top left um, is an individual that uh, sells at the local farmer's market uh, in, in Utah, Park City, Utah. Okay, this guy's actually in California, hangs out, uh, puts uh, some exciting stuff on his menu. Um, this is a, a group out of, uh, of Texas, and in fact, uh, is, is this guy that markets it, and that's in Austin, Texas, outside of Austin, Texas, okay? And uh, that's the provider, uh, my, myself, and then the, the business owner at that bar in that locale. And you know that on that menu, uh, it says that that is I.O. Ranch Lamb, okay? And I'm providing that uh, differences in terms of value. I believe that uh, we have uh, foodies in our industry, uh, that uh, also push uh, the, the envelope on, on being able to, uh, to be our leaders and to uh, assist us on telling that story. Different people, okay, this one's in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this guy uh, is actually in the, the Denver area. This one's in Seattle. Uh, this one's in the Fort Collins area. But I totally think it's real, all right? And so, again, we have... So, you know, so uh, a, a great uh, group, uh, and I appreciate you guys uh, being out here. So who remembers uh, um, a, a television station called MTV? Right? Well, a few, okay. <laughs> right? And they once had, like, music videos on there, right? Okay? And there was once, like, rock stars or whatever, and they thought they were cool. Is there even any, an MTV anymore? Okay, good. Glad you watch it. All right. But what's that? No music videos, just reality shows. Okay. Now, okay, now who watches the Food Channel? How many people we got there, okay? I am highly convinced that no longer is it even about rock stars, okay? Sorry, I can say this to Canada, Justin Bieber fans. All right. Um, but it's about foodies. It's about chefs. It's about the people that make culture happen. Sure, music was cool, all right? Again, I didn't live through Woodstock, whatever, all right? But um, now it's the chefs, it's the people that provide different things on our plates uh, that I think are the, the real rock stars uh, for our industry. Point of sale marketing, we have lots of different uh, marketing uh, that we have in those grocery stores, whether it's spring lamb, okay? This one uh, was, was a pretty high and expendy one because that one was in Beverly Hills, California, okay? Um, here is a, 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 I believe, a, a superior um, portion uh, of, of promotion. Here's Nyman Ranch. Uh, this one is uh, also part of the Mountain States Rosen, uh, some of our companies. And again, we don't have that much uh, differences in, in terms of, of companies uh, that oversee it, okay? And, and so those companies, uh, again, uh, there's, there's one large processing plant in Denver, Colorado, that's uh, owned by Superior Farm. There's another large one outside of Sacramento, California, owned by Superior Farms. There's one in Greeley, Colorado, um, based, um, that is owned by Mountain States Rosen. Uh, there's one in uh, the Detroit area, 
okay? And by Wolverine and, and just a few smaller ones there in kind of Chicago, Pennsylvania areas. But for the most part, uh, there's not very many big harvesting processing. And those lands particularly that would get sold in like New Holland, Pennsylvania, which is one of the larger auction barns in the northeast part here of America anyway, um, a lot of those go to, uh, to either backyard or ethnic or harvest facilities. But uh, from a grocery standpoint, we got lots of different things that are out here. This is one um, that um, I have on here on, on food fraud. Okay, and so this is lamb shoulder chops, product of USA. This is from the same one that says product of a different country. It says Australia on there. Liars. Okay. This is awesome promo. The lamb shoulder and O bone chops are from the USA, not from New Zealand, as stated on the tag. <laughs> really? Okay. And this was actually in the store that was like a block from my house. Okay. In Colorado. Because they didn't want to change their SKU or their storekeeping unit, they're like, well, we'll just put... Um, an American one in there or not, and not the New Zealand, okay? Because New Zealand didn't send them anything that week. So they had to step up. This one says USDA Prime uh, American Leg of Lamb. It says USDA Choice there on the blue. And this one, this one's the worst. Lamb Loin Chops, Grade A, okay? And I get it, okay? Maybe that's part of uh, our Canada's grading system, but that is not part of America's, all right? So uh, that's what they chose. Lamb Processed Meats, and again, uh, uh, Lori, I'm on pace because i got 15 minutes left for uh, some questions yet. Um, and so hopefully, uh, worst case scenario, I spurn some thoughts and some ideas in the, uh, for us. But with our lamb processed meats, there's lamb bacon on the left. And that lamb bacon had to sacrifice itself for the sake of science in my frying pan right under beneath that. Okay? So, I mean, it's a tough cost to do in business. Rosemary garlic uh, lamb sausage, uh, different uh, roasted uh, leg of lamb. And, and these guys are awesome. All right, they uh, they uh, were in Austin, Texas, and they had lots of different lamb products uh, that they use. I know I didn't put a picture big enough, but this guy's got a picture of a, a pig, and it says "Defend Bacon." <laughs> All right, and this guy said he's got a, a piece of of uh, a bacon on there, and it says "Smoke Meat Every Day." All right, um, so at least the, you knew that they were in it. All right, they were they were bought into the game uh, that was uh, processed meats. I got just uh, about four slides uh, left, and we'll open it up, and and hopefully again I've I've provided some thoughts for you, and then we'll answer it after, uh, after break and kind of really dig into it. But on the economics of the restrictions of land purchases, this is one thing that I didn't think we, we were going to really highlight, but I, I think it's worth looking at. That when asked to the supermarkets or the butchers and the farmer's market is, uh, let's see here, is there any specific economic conditions that determine pricing behavior? And it was price, price, and price, Right? So what was it? You know, I mean, obviously, that's a challenge for some of those respondents, particularly in the grocery sector. Now, we should know that. But here's another thing that's fun as well, and I talked about it yesterday, that go on a price standpoint or economics is just a little bit inelastic. And so those different individuals that are celebrating a, an, an ethnic holiday, you know what? They're going to buy goat or lamb if it's lamb that they prefer, all right? They're going to buy lamb. You could price it at $300. I don't care. You could price it maybe even more. Because if that's what they do on that holiday, that's what they're going to do. And so, in fact, here we had some individuals said pricing, no impact. Pricing, no impact. Quality was more important. And so there's two different specific demographics of people that we're uh, merchandising lamb to. Those that are price conscious and those that say, whatever, I'm going to buy lamb. Okay? And so it makes it a little bit tougher uh, as we talk about it. Product uniformity is extremely good. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a quick qu quote that I got uh, and received from one of the respondents. We had 120 total respondents. If only we could make lambs with big racks and loins and small shoulders and legs. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a great idea. Okay. It's going to be a little tougher. Lamb suits um, many retail food service markets with a variety of cuts. And so I just put that in there because... I think it's good. I mean, what we do in terms of utilization of those products is awesome. I mean, awesome. Okay, and I'll touch on it in our, our last uh, or portion after the break here on just the value in different cuts as well. 
land product dimensions. This is the last uh, portions of these slides that I'm going to look at because we looked at uh, evaluations on size, okay, and those product dimensions. And then lastly, we looked at tenderness. I know it's a big slide, and I apologize for that, but we looked at longissimus dorsi area. Longissimus dorsi is that big muscle that's on your T-bone chop, or the big muscle, okay, that main muscle that's a part of the rib rack um, that, that you're eating right there, okay? And so that larger muscle, the U.S. averaged 3.03, Australia a little smaller at 2.60 square inches. Sorry, I should have converted it. Um, uh, my bad, but uh, in square inches, sorry to give you that. Um, 2.25 in New Zealand, so they're quite a bit smaller. And in terms of fat, this is interesting as well, is that the Australian was actually trimmer, okay, than um, our American or the New Zealand. So the New Zealand, uh, at least the American was, was heavy muscular, heavy muscled and fat, all right, Australia was in the middle and at least trimmer, and all right, New Zealand's rocking it out of being light muscled and chubby, okay? So, but they're making progress, and all these countries are making progress, and in fact, relatively soon going to whip us. Tenderness, uh, and I, again, I talked with uh, Jason a little bit on the way here um, on, in terms of tenderness. The takeaway slide on here is that Australia and New Zealand on rib chops was more tender than the American, and on loin chops, it was more tender than the loin chops. There wasn't a difference on grass-fed versus grain-fed, but I'll tell you thing, one thing that's important that keeps this into consideration is that that number on, on kilograms of 1.90, the average, so about to be tough, or the, where 50% of it's tough, 50% of it's tender, is about 4.4 is the number. A beef tenderloin averages at 2.2. You want a lower number, okay? The amount of, of strength that it takes to make that cut with your teeth in generalities. Lamb's so darn tender it doesn't matter, okay? We rarely would lose market share because of, uh, of tenderness challenges. We win that. It's flavor that makes this a little bit more challenging, okay? And so uh, I want to open it up. Again, I got 10, 12 minutes here before break. Um, so hopefully I inspired just a little bit of thought process uh, that we could try to figure out where we're going and what questions we can answer in the second portion on lamb quality. Turn some on. Any questions here for Dr. Hoffman? It was close to the last slide where you talked about price point. I was curious why it didn't show up in the previous. Was it just because you're, you were looking at um, quality versus price point before that? Uh, really, really good question. And so you said, you know, why did price only come up here on, you know, slide 47 or something out of it, okay? Because when we asked the questions on lamb quality, we said keep price out of it. Okay, and so if we said, you know, why do you purchase this lamb? We did not want price to be a part of it. Otherwise, you know, a large group of the people would have said, well, I buy Australian because it's cheaper, because it's at 50 or 60 percent. And so, great question. We said, all things the same, what are the differences in quality? Thank you for that really, really good question. Uh, just uh, carrying on on that, uh, the price there. I noticed on that, you said it's, it's price, it's price, it's price. Is some of that because people are not as familiar with what to do with the lamb once they get it home? They've eaten it at a restaurant, it was really good, but I'm not going to spend that amount on the, uh, I'm not going to spend that amount on the lamb because I'm really not sure what to do with it when it gets there. I'm back here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to figure out where that was coming from, okay? Um, and, and so you're saying that, that it's not price that it's about how to prepare it? A combination of yep. both of them there. Yep. Okay, and so, um, uh, again, price is part of it, but that's very, very true. That That's a limiting factor. I, would, I will totally agree with that, that that's a limiting factor of people not knowing or not understanding what to do or what to accomplish with the lamb that they would purchase at a grocery store. So that's, that's totally a, a part of it, yes. Did you have any particular question... Or just that relationship between it? Just more or less the relationship between there, because I know that in, in some other yeah. cuts, fish being an example, it's, if it's too expensive, people look at it and say, yeah, I'd really like to try that, but boy, I'm not spending 15 bucks for a meal, and then find that I really, really messed it up and I can't eat it. Yep, most definitely. I, I think that we lose consumers uh, based on the, the challenge or at least the thought process 
of, of being able to cook that, that lamb product and, and cook it correctly. And, and uh, you know, in my personal opinion, uh, you know, lamb is best rare to medium rare, okay? I mean, well done lamb just doesn't sound entertaining to me. Um, but uh, that, that's uh, an advantage that we have, okay? And, and, uh, and people can, you know, you know, use a secret opportunity like rosemary, right, or, or garlic, but I prefer, I prefer not mint jelly because that's like throwing ketchup on a prime steak, okay? I don't like that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, if, if lamb is processed in New Zealand, there's a little Arabic sign that it's been blessed. And that is a huge market. Anybody around the Mediterranean, Middle East, and I worked in food basics for 17 years, and one staff came back one day, muttering about people that came to Canada who couldn't even speak English. I said, maybe they're from Syria. And yes, they were. That couple, I took a shoulder, and it was New Zealand, it had to be, and they saw the code on it. I said, so much a pound. I didn't know about their English, so I slapped my shoulder with one hand and held the shoulder. Then I did it with the back leg. Do you know what? They bought both legs, front and back. And Did you have to grab both butts? Yeah! Oh, they were just laughing. They had good English. It was hilarious. But for every family of refugees, there's 20 people have to be available to sponsor. The 20 people that are sponsored, that one family, said, well, let's try land. We've got a real growth in our ethnic market just because we've got Syrian refugees. Probably there'll be more from Africa. But that thing that New Zealand have done with that blessing, that is critical. So, uh, to the best of my knowledge, at least from those large processing plants that I talked about on Mountain States Roads and, and Superior, is that they put that halal symbol on it, okay? Yeah. And in fact, uh, and I know in Wolverine as well, um, in, in Detroit, is that they put those symbol on it, and in fact, they have um, Muslim individuals that are imams, I-M-A-N, that do the harvest, okay, with a uh, sharper knife than anybody should have in their hand, yeah. right? Um, and, and so, at least from the American standpoint, they're doing that. Is that because everything gets sold as halal? No. But does that provide the option to open the market? Thank you for a really good comment. On the food sickness slide, um, is it, was the reason that lamb was so low? Because we have so few <laughs> lambs sold, so few, much, few lamb meat. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> um, no, I wouldn't say that because, I mean, we still, we still are consuming, you know, a, a pound of it, um, you know, per person. I, I missed it by a long ways, but um, by a, a pound per person per year, okay? And the example that I would uh, potentially put against that would be, uh, would be Brussels sprouts, okay? So who eats more than a pound of Brussels sprouts per year? Good, see? I can use those as a similarity. But some of those green vegetables... Uh, cause a lot more food safety illnesses, okay? And so, and even in comparison to the amount of consumption, yeah, sure, we don't eat it as much as chicken, but the amount that we had in 16 years in lamb could potentially be a couple months in chicken, okay? Because they got this really cool stuff called salmonella, all right? And beef has challenges with E. coli, 015787. 7. It's real. So I like your point, but I'm not going to fall for it. Uh, here in Ontario and Canada, we've got, on the beef side of things, uh, big consumer promotions in terms of Angus beef or hormone-free. hormone, home, hormone free. I haven't heard anything in any of the, the research that even alluded to, to those like breed specifics or hormone brand or hormone-free. Uh, any, any comments? Good. That's why Lori put me on for a, a second one. We'll talk a little bit about breeds. Uh, breed is not an advantage because there's not that much difference. Okay? And in fact, you could maybe say that there's not that much difference on Angus either. Okay? They just have a sweet marketing promo. All right? And beat everybody to it. All right? Sorry for the Angus producers. All right? I have Angus too. Um, but they provide the specification. And do you know how much Angus it takes to be in certified Angus beef? Yeah. Black hide it. All right? You can be zero. Okay? If you were a black scimitol that meets a 12 to 16 square inch ribeye and doesn't have a hump and uh, meets a modest uh, marbling, all right? Yeah, there's not many humpy cattle here in Canada, okay? Uh, but so that's not a requirement. Hormone free, um, it isn't a challenge or it isn't a portion in the United or in lamb period because there's only one growth promoting that uh, is approved for use in, uh, in lambs and that's Xeranol, okay? 
or Ralgro, and Ralgro is not used because Ralgro, if you do use Ralgro, some will say, well, maybe you get a little increase in, in weight gain, or maybe you get a little increase in carcass weight, but those don't always happen. And what I can tell you is if we use Ralgro is that we increase the amount of rectal prolapses by like 10%, okay? And so whatever 0.04% we were going to get on uh, growth, we lose on animals that have an increased amount of prolapses. So we don't use them. Should we put hormone-free? Maybe. Go ahead. Oop. Considering uh, the cattle industry lifted the country of origin labeling for importation of live animals, why did the American sheep industry refuse to do that for live animals out of Canada? Wow, we got some brilliant questions. Thank you. Um, and so the, the sheep industry says, and they've been a lobby, lobbying that says, we want to keep the labeling for American lamb on there because our largest challenges are um, New Zealand and Australia. The American cattle and beef industry either gets cattle in or gets beef in and can say that it's product of USA if they take country of origin labeling off. So you can, if a, Mex if a steer is born in Mexico or Canada, okay, we should use that. If a steer is born here and it's harvested in an American plant in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it can be product of USA without stricter labeling laws. But the sheep and lamb industry was more protective and said, we want to keep country of origin labeling. Okay, just for the interest of time, I think we're going to cut it off there, but uh, Dr. Hoffman will be back. So uh, um, after our break here, um, he will be